one of the TLCC 2017 logo colors, and, and I am. Also, San Diego Padres, go! Um, it's, it's really such a pleasure to have this platform. I'm so grateful uh, to Tessa Toro for letting the Museum of Chinese in America, myself today, share a few thoughts about the museum. Um, we don't take this opportunity for granted. For a small cultural museum in a very large space, we don't get a lot of opportunities like this. Um, but my name's Nancy L. Mosbach. I'm the president of MOCA. Um, can we all say MOCA? MOCA. Um, and I really want to share a little bit today about unlocking customer data management. So the title of my talk, Michael Wong, have you eaten yet? <laughs> you may be wondering, who's Michael Wong? <laughs> Why do I care if he's eaten yet? And what does this possibly have to do with customer data management? Well, let me explain. Does anyone know a Michael Wong? Anyone know a Michael Wong? OK, OK, I see a few hands. I'm not surprised if you know a Michael Wong. If you do a search in whitepages.com, you will find over 2,100 Michael Wongs, compared with only 100 Jack Rubens, and only six Don Youngbergs, and six Andrew Racinos. <laughs> 2,100 Michael Wongs. So why is that? Wong is the most common surname among Chinese people. And as you might have suspected, one of those most popular first names in the Western world is Michael, and especially in the United States. Now, in the hopes of integrating into a new country, reducing instances of, wait, what's your name? Many Chinese immigrants, like my father, Yao Tse, or William, William went to the library, borrowed a book of names, and started doling them out. So brother Yao Jie Mei became James. I call him Jimmy. Mother Gong Tian Xia became Tina. And I, Yao Nan Xun, became Nancy. So, Back to the part of the title, have you eaten yet? If you've heard this question before among Chinese people, it conveys a familialness, a kinship, a warmth, a simplicity, a sense that for a moment, someone will take care of you. So have you eaten yet also means welcome. How are you? So what in the world does this have to do with knowing your member or your customer for that matter? Well, let me tell you a little bit about why I bring this up. When I first joined the Museum of Chinese in America about three years ago, very eager new president, I went out to meet everyone I could. Trustees, I met community leaders, I met former disgruntled staff, I met funders, <laughs> you, know, you name it, I went and met them. And I needed to do this for two real reasons, two main reasons. One, I desperately wanted to understand the community, identify partners, hear ideas, identify strategic tensions. The list goes on, very common to many of you. But the second biggest reason is that on my first day, when I asked my assistant to print out MOCA's membership list, she responded, I have been instructed not to open the database because it will crash. And I have no idea how many members we have. So images flooded through my mind. <laughs> Should I retreat? Should I run? Would I be able to get a refund on my parking permit? <laughs> Even my near-death experience eating blowfish at my last job seemed manageable. You see, I had come across 12 Michael Wongs in the first few weeks of my job at MOCA. All unidentifiable, all without any clear donor giving, all without any ounce of relationship management color. And I'm good with names. And I realized that any good intentions were lost. Anything I could do at this point was, at best, superficial. And all the floating commentary about the museum 
that we were short-sighted, that we only paid attention at gala time, that we lacked heart, were all somewhat valid. We did not prioritize understanding or getting to know our member. And with any team or staff turnover, our world kind of started all over again. So we were disingenuous. And that was further magnified by the central purpose and mission of our museum, to share the untold stories of the making of the United States and to share and help understand the search for identity. So let me tell you a quick few minutes about the Museum of Chinese in America. The museum is about the Chinese immigration story to the United States. And you can substitute Chinese with Irish, with German, with Italian, with so many different immigrant groups, with Syrians, because the experience are very similar. This museum is not about the US-China relationship. And with the rise of China, I do find the Chinese American identity and many other identities has become marginalized. And frankly, if you want to see a beautiful Chinese porcelain vase, I recommend the Met. <laughs> so the museum over time, we've been around 37 years, um, we have collected items. We're telling the story of this immigration story, a very complex immigration story, one really characterized by struggle, uh, by quite a bit of um, discrimination. Um, many of you may know, or many of you may not know, and I wouldn't be surprised because it is not in textbooks today, that the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 was not repealed until 1943 over 60 years, and the only formal legislation in the United States against a group of people to come into this country. And today, when we witness things around the immigration issue, 23-step vetting process for Syrians and others, it is too reminiscent for so many of those who remember the Chinese Immigration and Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. So some of these are the stories that we tell, and these are images within our museum and the core exhibit. And even so, we're trying to right wrongs in history. This is a celebratory image taken at the end of the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. Most, mostly Chinese people built that railroad. But if you look closely at the image, there's not one person of Chinese ancestry in this photograph. Corky Lee, a wonderful photographer, um, decided to right that wrong by getting descendants of the Transcontinental Railroad workers to come together at the exact same site and take this photo annually. These young men and women, we call them our favorite heroines of dumpster diving. <laughs> they went 37 years ago and saw value in this history, when many Chinese Americans didn't see value in it. And when they saw that different items were getting destroyed and that people were throwing precious signs of Chinese laundries and restaurants into dumpsters, not understanding that there would be a value for those items one day, they decided to collect them. And that's how the Museum of Chinese in America was born. Their first exhibit, Eight Pound Livelihood, the story of the Chinese laundryman. And can I tell you an anecdote? We had an intern a couple of years ago at an Ivy League institution. I said to her, go into the museum. Tell me something tomorrow that you didn't know today. And she came back the next day and she said, Nancy, I didn't realize that Chinese people didn't like to do laundry. I didn't realize that Chinese people didn't like to open restaurants. I didn't realize, Nancy, that Chinese people didn't have a choice. And so further, we continue to recognize the value in the work that we were doing, preserving and giving identity to some of that history. And it was until 1965 where Johnson immigrated, had created the Immigration and Naturalization Act that you really saw a flood from all countries. 20,000 was a quota from any given country. So today, this story might not resonate as well because you, everyone in the room is very clearly aware of a Chinese person, Chinese American friends, colleagues, and so forth. But that history still needs to be written. So we started seeing so many packages in front of the museum, suitcases full of documents, chung sams, um, artifacts, anonymously placed, and we started building our collection. Currently, our collection has 65,000 items. So going back to where we are today, knowing the customer, 
as a museum of identity and the search for that identity and sharing some of those untold stories, but not knowing one Michael Wong from the next Michael Wong, or anyone for that matter, we realized that the 50 different systems we had to try to understand our system completely did not work. We had Razor's Edge doing memberships and gifts and pro providing financial data. Mocha built insights, CounterPoint. We had at least 50 different Excel spreadsheets for education, for development, outbound software, you name it, we had it. <laughs> <laughs> so we realized we needed a new system. And I cannot express more sincerely how Tessitora has given us the ability to think dynamically and to really grow. For a young, small institution going through a midlife crisis, we needed one place where we could house all this data. We integrated in April 2016, and that was a very good day for the museum. Now we have online donations, online reservations, online memberships, CRM, Mocha Shop, in-person tickets, grand process, reservations, donations, all in one place. And that has been able to give us output in acknowledgments, financial information, and membership. Then we started understanding Michael Wong. Michael Wong loves programs. He loves to hear from thought leaders. We started a program that I moderate called Mission Possible, where we can give inspiration to young people and others who might want to be interested in going into politics, going into different sectors. We also started realizing that Michael Wong wanted to hear from curators. Less than 1% of Asian Americans go into arts and culture. Less than 1% of Asian Americans go into arts and culture. That's because of the burden and legacy of the Exclusion Act, I think. Because my parents told me to be safe, not to pursue things that were risky, because they saw and they witnessed some of that discrimination. So we started a curators in conversation session, identifying other role models in the field. Michael Wong loves collections. He wants to understand what's in that history, what is of value. We started digitizing 30,000 items within our 65,000 collection. Michael Wong wanted to understand what was of value. How could he take down his father's oral history? How could he preserve the photographs? We started a conference called Family Treasures. Michael Wong loved to celebrate. We have an education area where 1,000 square feet has been now converted into a research center, into a rest and play, into a book library for books that you can't normally find. And he likes to bring his friends to the museum. Michael Wong likes to eat. <laughs> so we thought, what can we do to bring Michael Wong and the, the Chinatown richness, the food, into the wall? And we decided to break it out. So the Museum of Chinese in America continued to add on walking tours, making Chinatown its campus, um, going beyond doing food tours and flushing, all the different places that we could possibly reach out and share some of that Chinese American identity. I'm so excited to share that the New York City Department of Transportation saw what we were doing, that we had created a Chinatown map, not without any commercial advertisements, but layered identity explained and they have now commissioned us to have 50 different wayfinders throughout Chinatown, New York City, including six large vinyl wraps at each of the gateways of Chinatown. And that's what we've been able to do because we're beginning to know what Michael Wong likes. Subsequently, we have over 2,500 members now. 600% increase from the number that I discovered was 408. So a 600% increase in 18 months. We received so many accolades, over 200 from major press. Condé Nast picked us as one of the 10 best small museums in New York City. Our social media capacity has gone over nearly 1 million. And so much of that is because of the work that we've done knowing our customers. Our current exhibit, Sour, Sweet, Bitter, Spicy, Xuan Tian Ku La, Stories of Chinese Food and Identity, Hyperallergic picked it as one of the top 10 art exhibits last year. And most importantly, we can honestly and genuinely say, Michael Wang, have you eaten yet? Thank you.